All right, so um, thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of Ignite. So there was a group of uh, individuals listed here who theoretically worked on this group of slides. Um, in reality, this is really the result of our um, last face-to-face -face meeting and our dinner turned into um, really sort of a forward-thinking um, exercise in, in where we believed um, the network had great opportunities in the future. So um, it, it really, I think, is a broad representation of um, where the network is, is thinking. So uh, I think you've heard earlier, particularly um, uh, in the uh, first two presentations from um, Carol and Josh, that over the last two or three years, depending on when the groups um, came into the network, um, we in many ways have documented the feasibility of doing genomic medicine implementation. We have not necessarily solved all of the challenges, but across many, many different types of settings, um, academic medical center, urban, rural, private practice, the VA, VA maybe uh, being the most complicated of all those, unfortunately, um, inpatient, outpatient settings, um, we have effectively across many different kinds of study um, been able to implement genomic medicine. Um, we've identified barriers and challenges, um, and in many ways I would argue that we have overcome many of those. There are still, there are still um, problems to solve, um, but in many ways those are sort of logistical challenges, and we have discovered many of those. Um, I leaned over to Jonathan when he sat down and I said, um, once I get through with my talk, it will look like we sat down side by side and presented our, or prepared our presentations. Um, because I think we as a network believe that um, in the end, sustainability and widespread adoption of genomic medicine is going to require a much stronger evidence base. The reality is I think we've proven in this, in this phase of the network that we can do it, but without the evidence base, clinicians won't adopt it and payers won't pay it for it. So we really need to be thinking hard, just like the previous two speakers have mentioned, um, about building the evidence that documents the clinical utility, including the impact on clinical outcomes, uh, as well as the economic impact. Um, so you saw these slide, uh, this slide earlier, um, and, but, and I'd like to use this as an example of a single site versus a network um, effort. And so um, we implemented the CYP2C19 uh, genotype-guided antiplatelet therapy uh, in our institution as part of our program at University of Florida. And um, then we, uh, after the fact, then looked at outcomes, clinical outcomes. And so these data were presented last year at the American Heart Association meeting. Um, and so we were really testing where clopidogrel was a standard of care therapy and those who have a loss of function genotype and cannot bioactivate the drug, um, we recommended alternative therapy. When that alternative therapy was not adopted, the patients had significantly worse outcomes, the outcome in being death, stroke, myocardial infarction, um, so outcomes that I think we all agree matter, um, whereas if they had a loss of function and got alternative therapy or did not have loss of function but continued on clopidogrel, they had very good outcomes. Um, you'll also note that many of these events occur in the first month of therapy. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a diagnosis for which Medicare doesn't pay for a 30-day readmission, um, so we think the economic implications are significant. Um, however, this is one site, 400 patients, maybe you just got lucky. Um, so the level that people will sort of believe that and change practice nationwide is limited. Um, and so we said, is there an opportunity within Ignite, um, both within the funded groups in the network, but also through our affiliate membership, uh, to document this in a much more broad-based manner? Um, and so. The Ignite Pharmacogenetics Interest Group is one of the interest groups, and in your workbook um, describes all of the activities ongoing. Um, Josh Peterson described another project um, of the group, but our first major project was to look at cyp 2 19 genotype-guided antiplatelet therapy, not just at the University of Florida, um, but at nine sites, um, and we ended up with 4,477 patients in our um, data cohort. Um, We'll say right here that Vanderbilt University has a significant portion of that cohort, and I think their data are represented for you in the, in the handout as well. Um, so, so we have done this collaborative effort, developed a uh, common data tool. Seven of the sites did manual data extraction from the EHR 
Um, the other two sites did electronic data extraction. Uh, we presented, uh, prepared the data, um, submitted to the American Heart Association in their late breaker um, abstract submission, and were selected for what they're calling a hot clinical science session, which is, as we're understanding it, at the same, um, at the same level as the late breakers. It's just that all of the things in that session are not um, sort of true uh, randomized con controlled clinical trials. So we can't share the data with you because they're embargoed, um, but we're, our goal is to um, publish these data in a um, simultaneous publication with a, with a presentation in a high-impact journal. So we'll let you guess what the data look like. Um, so we think that our bottom line is that we have positive outcomes data with 400 patients, um, but that wasn't likely to change practice. But with nearly 5,000 patients, maybe we have the opportunity to change practice as it relates to antiplatelet therapy post-PCI. Um, there are also economic opportunities, and so um, side by side we have an economic um, analysis that is ongoing and in homes um, from IU and Nita Limdi, both who are here. Uh, Nita's from UAB, um, affiliate member. Um, and again, I think uh, just to point out, we've really created um, a lot of power in the network by engaging affiliate members. Um, so we have an, an analysis ongoing of the outcomes um, data as it relates to the economic implications. And then you heard earlier today um, about the broader economic uh, study that IU is doing with their pharmacogenomic-based program. Um, so just to, again, highlight, all of us were funded, six groups. Three of us are focused in pharmacogenetics, three in disease genetics. And, and really, the root of our programs are focused on uh, documenting the um, approaches to clinical implementation, the barriers, and the challenges that we face with that. Um, Nonetheless, all of us are developing some um, clinical evidence. And just so to run through these, uh, in the Monogenic Di Diabetes Project at University of Maryland, uh, their goal is to, from a clinical evidence perspective, to document changes in diagnosis, treatment, glycemic control, <coughs> hypoglycemic episodes, hospitalizations, et cetera. Um, they also have a very strong economic element. Um, the APOL1 story in um, hypertensive African Americans, you heard a lot about that this morning. Um, they also have a clinical outcome, which is blood pressure control. Um, and then the Family Hi History Project at Duke, uh, looking at whether that family history information changes a variety of clinical factors, including lifestyle and risk factor management, um, changes in their clinical care course, um, et cetera. We would argue that all of these things could more powerfully answer outcomes if there were more than one site, um, more than one project focusing on them. And even though all of us have multiple um, settings where we're implementing this, um, we believe the power to document these kind of outcomes would be much greater, just like we saw with the clopidogrel cyp 2 c 19 story, um, if we were, um, where we were able to accrue much, much larger numbers. So we believe that the barrier, the greatest barrier moving forward is uh, the clinical evidence gap. And we can solve all of these other problems. We can figure out all the informatic stuff, but if the clinical evidence isn't there, um, it probably won't matter. Because we have to have the clinical evidence in order for clinicians to actually adopt into clinical practice and for the payers to pay. Um, and so we believe that moving forward, the network uh, should have more focus on clinical evidence generation. And I think as Muin mentioned early in his talk, we can do this, continue to look at the implementation elements, um, but we need to make sure that uh, the clinical evidence generation is sitting right beside that. Um, and again, using the clopidogrel example as a, a project as an example, we believe the power to accomplish that uh, would be mo much greater with network-wide efforts as opposed to a single site. Um, so in terms of our summary and recommendations, um, we believe that the network has documented across a lot of clinical settings the feasibility of implementing genomic medicine into clinical practice. Um, however, in order for this to be sustained and adopted when you don't have grant funding to fund the genotyping, when you don't have grant funding to sort of make these things happen, um, that we have to have uh, sufficient clinical evidence. Um, and so as a suggestion, a recommendation would be to think about structuring uh, IGNITE2 in a way that looks 
more like traditional NIH networks where we work on common projects and can build evidence in a manner that's sufficiently powered and sufficiently robust to actually change practice. Thank you.